Hey everybody, what's going on? It's 2 p.m. on a Wednesday afternoon, which means you're tuning in to Cannabis Legalization News. I'm producer Lauren, and today we're gonna to be speaking with Ron Christensen, the CEO of Grasshopper Kiosk. But first, we're gonna get into a little bit of cannabis news. So please welcome our hosts, Tom from Cannabis Industry Lawyer, and Josh Hi. Kincaid from The Talking Hedge. What's going on, guys? Uh, well, I, I kind of made the state of Illinois weekend uh, in the sense that I was reading the FAQ section. Um, I didn't bring up a copy of that, but I did just make a, a page on our website, Cannabis Legalization, I'm sorry, Cannabis Industry Lawyer. Uh, and if you go there, backslash uh, disproportionately impacted area map, this disproportionately impacted area is exceedingly important when it comes to the issue of who is a social equity applicant. You get points for being a social equity applicant. In fact, 20 percent of your points are based on that. However, in the uh, the FAQ, the frequently asked questions that was provided by the state of Illinois on their uh, IDPFR, the uh, Professional and Financial Regulatory Authority in Illinois website, uh, it had this uh uh, time for the map and these two agencies uh, in which they were going to uh, release the, the disproportionately impacted agents uh, uh, map to the world so we could look at it and determine who is a social equity applicant. That has been changed. They have uh, re-updated the, uh, the FAQ and they've deleted the, uh, the deadline, which was last Tuesday. Uh, the 26th, which was two months after the effective date of June 26th when the governor uh, signed it. And they've also deleted one of the two uh, agencies in Illinois' government that is supposed to be coming up with this map. So that was pretty big news. And now it looks like one agency is in charge of making this map, and I'm not sure when they're going to release it, but they're supposed to have the applications next month. What happened out west, Josh? Well, uh, our regulatory agency, the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board, gave us eight days before this uh, Labor Day weekend to come up with our own social equity uh, response to their program. So they kind of bombarded us just a week before. It's due today, as a matter of fact. So they gave us eight days uh, before that weekend to kind of give a response and it's long winded. It doesn't have a lot of information. In fact, I like Illinois social equity. It has 750,000 or less in income for the previous year, 51% ownership. Uh, but you have to be there five years. That's the part I don't really like about Illinois is five years in cannabis is a decade. Uh, so whatever Washington decides to do with the, the limited time they've given us to respond, uh, time will tell. But it's it's not looking good right out the bat. Yeah, the, the social equity aspect for Illinois, the more that I dig into it, the more I'm a little bit frustrated and concerned that it appears to be a nothing burger or at least a giveaway to the rich because uh, they're trying to improve the, uh, the diversity and then to give access to people that have been really disproportionately injured by the drug wars uh, to the cannabis industry. And so there's really just three ways that you can get a social equity status is number one, you can have uh, an arrest for an expungeable offense. These are low level marijuana and cannabis arrests in the sense that, you know, uh, intent to distribute less than an ounce, an ounce or less, or possession of up to a pound or less. And then that's that's one silo. If you have that and you're 51% ownership control of that, you get those points. Or you're in a different silo. And that is if you live in one of these disproportionately impacted areas, we don't know where those are, which really stinks. So then, you know, 50 percent of them, we don't know. And then the third one is if at the time that you apply, you're already a business and you have more than 10 full time employees and 51 percent of them, a.k.a. six of those 10 full time employees are from number one or number two. That is that they were arrested for an expungeable offense or they live in one of these disproportionately impacted areas. We don't know what those are. So as this application is supposed to be here in a month, what are we going to do with the two thirds of the social equity application that we don't know how to deal with? And they're, it's 20 percent of the score. So like if somebody nails it, that might be the difference between getting a license and missing it. Right. And I have no doubt that it's going to be a lot of individuals who have the money and capability to get that license. There's advantages of, of getting ahead of the game and whether or not they hold that license for five years is irrelevant. As long as you get the license, you're in uh, 
in business. Yeah, you can sell it. Right? That five year restriction basically it includes like a give back of the money that you may have gotten from the state. And that might not be that much money in right. terms of cannabis dollars. I mean, right. a 50 percent reduction of the application fee, twenty five hundred bucks, you know, uh, or of the um actual license fee itself. So that's $30,000 a year. And then you may have actually been granted access to capital and funds. Those will be the ones that may have more of a chilling effect on it. But, you know, if you got like $500,000 from uh, this, this low interest loan grant program or whatever, uh, and somebody wants to buy your license, I don't think that $500,000 is going to scotch the deal. No. And even the fund that's been set aside for those impacted areas on the war on drugs hasn't been successful either. So if they're going to roll out additional programs, I'm not all that optimistic. Uh, having been in banking and seeing you know, how the uh, SBA loans don't really uh, help minorities, um, I just hope that uh, these uh, regulatory authorities in cannabis can do a little bit better. Uh, I'm not optimistic with the rollout, though. Yeah. But what I really thought was a really cool uh, holiday weekend, 5 p.m. on a Friday news right. dump last weekend was Donald Trump. The Donald Trump, we're, we're, the stuff that he said was very, very vague, but very, very direct in the sense that states are doing that or states are making that decision. It's not like he says states are legalizing it, but he says states are making that decision. We're watching that and we will allow it. And so I had to do a quick video about, oh, Mr. Trump, what's the limits of your executive power? And I made a fairly silly uh, video where I, I just went way beyond the pale of what the executive power allows. But I think that it's excellent in the sense that Donald Trump is saying to the media that they are going to basically allow uh, the states to legalize cannabis which is great and hopefully uh, foretells uh, a victory when the Congress reconvenes here any day now and we get the, the Safe Banking Act passed. It's the status quo. I don't necessarily uh, put a whole lot behind any uh, political figure in what they say, but what how I interpret it is that is what he's saying is that the, the states are doing it and the feds are allowing it. They, it's not like they will allow it. They're just letting it happen. Right. Right. But, you know, the, the, in the 30 years from the war on drugs and we're coming to stop you and like just say no to we'll allow it is right. that's, that's pretty, pretty uh, quick speed. Did you hear the, uh, the the stories out of Florida, though? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, all right. Let me, let me just share my screen real quick. All right. So the, the key issue in the medical marijuana for the states of Florida, and you have to understand, Florida is a little bit different than uh, the other states in the sense that Florida has um, a ballot initiative. And so because of that ballot initiative, uh, they then it, it creates cognitive dissonance between the people that put the vote to it and then the legislature that's like, Oh, so we have to do this, eh? Well, we'll do this. And uh, Florida said that they wanted medical marijuana, but then the legislature said that if you wanted to get one of these cannabis licenses, that you needed to be completely vertically integrated. Did you hear about that? I just heard like 30 years experience. Yes, I, I haven't dove into the, the details yeah. yet, but. All right. Well, I mean, That's so you have to be completely vertically integrated. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So like the, the licenses that they're giving out are being valued at like 50, 60, 70 million dollars because you're completely vertically integrated. So you have the dispensing, you have the flowers. I'm not sure if they have a transport, but the extractor, the infuser, and you'd have to have all those licenses plus all that crazy experience that they said uh, to be able to be uh, issued one of these licenses. And so that's getting fought out in the Supreme Court, whether or not that's that's legal to do. And then here was the other cool headline from Florida. How many doctors does it take to justify or certify 94,850 Floridians? Ooh, six. Actually, uh, if by the rules of uh, what was that? Uh, Price is right. You win because the actual correct answer is uh, 89. And so... <laughs> Where is that? There are uh, just 89 doctors certified 94,850 Florida patients. So, I mean, it's uh, an interesting kind of 
rubric that they have down there in Florida. But uh, Illinois has done something a little bit better in the sense that they, in their craft growth system, have created laws in the sense that they are going to try to really address uh, the 800 pound gorilla of uh, indoor grown cannabis, uh, mm -hmm. the cost of energy. And so, you know, that's that's, that's got to be big. And I'm not sure if some of the people that you interview uh, discuss that type of stuff. But the uh, uh, the energy requirements, though, mm -hmm. for for cannabis are like they're well known. And so with Illinois, now they're going to, you know, no more than 36 watts per square foot of cultivation canopy. And so they have to use these DLC uh, approved lights, automatic watering system. You know, they have to have specific watering events. It's it's really, really interesting that the state of Illinois is getting into green cannabis. But I think that's that's where like a lot of the business is can kind of live and thrive with the amount of uh, advancement and technological requirement that the regulators are putting on the uh, the craft grows and the indoor cultivation. And I'm surprised that California didn't lead the way with that type of regulation. They tend to to do that. But to put it in context for somebody in Illinois looking at licenses, we see partial licenses in California selling for $5 million, and that could be with four or five other partners. Phoenix, Arizona, I've seen $20 million for a retail license. Uh, and in Washington, million dollars for a retail license, twenty million dollars in Phoenix, Arizona, for a retail license, and that's because it's limited. Just like in in Vegas, uh, Nevada, it's it's very limited. Uh, and then in Washington, we've seen licenses be given away for the uh, future uh, hope of getting five to six percent royalties on whatever is sold. Literally giving licenses away. So when you had mentioned uh, these you know, tens of millions of dollars in, in Florida, it can kind of go both ways. If you're good, that's great. You can get five to 20 million. If you're terrible, you're going to have to give that license away and hope that somebody else can actually grow it and produce a product for you. Man, that's something else. But, you know, you mentioned California and that's where our guest is going to be joining us here in just a bit. And he's got uh, some technical acumen and something that's really, really interesting and different to the industry. I'm going to let Lauren take it away. Yeah. Come on in, Ron. Welcome hey guys. to Legalization News, Ron. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Well, great, why don't you great to meet you guys. To, uh, to your business. Sure, yeah. Um, my name is Ron Christensen. I'm the CEO of Grasshopper Kiosks. Uh, we're a uh, fully automated compliant uh, system for automated retail. Cool. And what does that all entail, a fully automated system for retail? Well, let me give you a screen share here. You guys can look at. Hold on one second. Screen share. Yep. It's the most elegant of all the screen sharing technologies. These are good people <laughs> at uh, StreamYard. They do wonderful stuff. <laughs> see if they can get this up here. Well, you know, I might be able to hit it right there for you. Why don't there you, you give us a, a background on it? I have uh, your site up. Can you see it? Yeah, I just I just popped it on. If you want to back that one down, sure. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so yeah, the general idea is that we've created an ecosystem around the consumer experience, um, leading with our flagship product, which is uh, a vending terminal that checks all the boxes for compliance that allows consumers to come up and browse products and quickly shop and. Uh, and, and the products are dispensed from that terminal. That's our flagship, so. That's fantastic. So it says hops, THC, now in stereo. I'm assuming that one of the hot new items out in the California market is some type of THC brew? Yeah, and, and that's that's one of our uh, current partners that we're working with. Um, we do branded solutions also for uh, brands that are seeking to uh, enter the market in California, and we're looking to do this also throughout the country. Fascinating. So when you say branded solutions, what does that uh, mean? Uh, is that uh, white labeling or? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we can. We, well, we would light, white label the um, uh, white label the machine for them. I think I'm back here on the screen, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so we'd white label the solution for them that would have their brand and products inside of it. Awesome. 
And uh, so how do you say that it's compliant? Why do you say it's compliant? What, what makes uh, your stuff, you know, what makes your machines compliant? Sure, yeah, what, we, what we've done is we've integrated to the point of sale systems in the industry, which allows us to report the data directly back to systems like metric that are ran by the states. Uh, or they're implemented by the states, ran by these individual companies. So we're able to do that. We also uh, require uh, ID swiping at the machine, uh, which ties directly into the POS so that the consumer is vetted a couple times before they um, purchase cannabis. Yeah, because like each one of them, they really do have to, uh, they have to you know, be carded. Their Their transaction needs to be recorded if they're going to be, complying with the uh, the point of sale systems uh, that are required under any particular state's uh, regulatory rubric. So what types of compliance are required in California when you make a cannabis purchase? Right. So um, I, I don't know how you guys do it in Illinois, but out here you have to check in at the front of the dispensary before you're able to enter. Is that similar there? Right. That's how it is here. So your card, yeah. they, they enter your card into a computer, but right now it's still all medicinal. And so we'll gotcha. see. And it, it looks like from the statute, it's going to be very similar with the adult use. So is it uh, very similar in California? Yeah, exactly. So they, they've adopted those same rules. So when you check in in California, you come up to the front, you check in, show your ID. Um, medical is almost non-existent as I can see it currently in the in the medical or in the retail space, I think that uh, we thought that there there would be more medical. We started in medical in uh, early 17 and started deploying machines then. And, and there was very little regulatory oversight in the medical world. Uh, today, that's changed quite a bit. We have quite, quite a bit of layered kind of uh, uh, rules and regs that we have to uh, adhere to. So, uh, Regarding the, uh, the, the process itself, after you've checked in at the front desk, then you simply come to the machine, swipe your ID again because you've been vetted at the door, which then allows you into the machine. You're able to do a purchase there. And then, um, of course, you've still got all the bagging requirements that you have. So uh, in, in addition to that, there are some, some rules in different municipalities about how the equipment's secured. So in some municipalities, we have to bolt down machines and so on. So so, so it's they the states kind of left it up to the municipal, municipality a bit to uh, to build their own structure around what the state's regs are, and so you see some some of the cities increasing, uh, and then you see others that just kind of follow what the states laid out. That's neat. I mean, like the thing in Illinois, there's like, uh, cause I was reviewing, I'm like, Oh wow, that's a really interesting concept uh, of your business, you know, for grasshopper, a vending machine for cannabis. And I could see how it could make it safer and like your inventory control and your diversion uh, prevention strategy, because you load the machine, the machine dispenses it, it, you know, takes your, your money and all that. And it keeps the accounts. It makes a lot of sense. It is specifically prohibited in the state of Illinois. It says no vending machines, and and I just think that that's kind of uh, fascinating that that you have to have these SOPs and standard operating procedures, and it's going to be like, well, you can't employ too much of a machine to uh, keep this 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 uh, cannabis sale automated because that's not allowed. Yeah, that that uh, you know, I think that. That, that as, as time goes on, I think things like, like that are going to loosen up. I think what they wanted to prohibit is people putting vending machines into public areas. I think that in Washington State, for instance, there was a company, and I don't recall the name right off the top of my head, but they deployed some machines there. And uh, pretty, pretty soon after, the state did a unanimous uh, uh, ruling that they were going to ban these in, uh, I believe it was in the state Senate. Is that right? You're up, Josh, you're up in washington you know what i'm talking about i do yeah so i think some of these are knee-jerk reactions to problems and i think that uh without all the information regulators are going to opt for the quickest solution which is to outlaw Mm -hmm. i think that they they need easiest it's so much easier to say no than it is to say wait what's this very complex problem and and the solution that you have for it i i just have to say no that was easy yeah, that was easy. And so, and I, and I think that's a lot of the things that are happening now are based on that. Um, you guys were talking about this uh, social equity thing earlier. And um, 
Uh, I think that I, I agree with what you guys were saying that, you know, th this, this is definitely not built for the guy who's been in trouble before or has a history uh, selling cannabis and, and uh, did time for it. I mean, this, the program is built for people that have money and uh, they need to, they need to figure out better ways, but this is going to take time. All these things take time. Right. And you can't I expect mean, that they happen overnight. And that's something that we were talking about before the show about how this industry is like the, the dot com boom of 20 years yeah, ago, totally. plastics of when the graduate yeah. movie that came out. And it's just uh, fascinating how entrepreneurial and how fast, and how without rules it really kind of feels like sometimes and then like right now you're sitting a few states away and they're approaching this automated uh retail machine as a as a theft mitigation as a security uh enhancement of their current status quo and where meanwhile over here in illinois we're like oh no <clears throat> Can't do that because of that that misconception of like what a, a, a vending machine is like it's going to be a Pepsi machine down the street and you're just able to feed quarters to it. I, that was one of the questions that I actually wanted to ask you about your machine was, did it have the ability to read somebody's ID to really match that uh, that sale to that particular person in some type of database to prevent this uh, problem in legalized states called looping. Have you guys ever heard of that? Yeah, it, they, we do. And in fact, in California, one of the, um, one of the parts of the law that I don't particularly like is that there is a daily limit for cannabis, which um, in practical terms is just a thing that most people would never hit. And that's an ounce of cannabis a day and eight grams of concentrate. Which would cost you probably a thousand bucks. I said, speak right. for yourself, Ron. <laughs> 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 well, uh, in in that case, you know, yeah, okay. So you have a you have a rule that you put in place. Other states have done this, I think, more effectively, where they've said, uh, you know, we we have limits for purchase, so mm -hmm. that you can go in many, many times and purchase throughout the day. Um, so what we've done to address that is we've uh, included, uh, there's a piece of software that, that we've added on that, it, that does validate state IDs. Um, we, we have compliance all the way up to facial recognition. I don't think that people in cannabis are ready for that. I think it's very early. So we wanted to adopt methodology that would allow uh, people to be comfortable with what they were doing or, or, or ways that they're used to kind of validating their identity. And so that's why we opted for ID scanning versus uh, going for something more robust, like a facial recognition. It's not that you couldn't do it. It's just that you thought it would right. be a bad idea and freak people out. Well, we asked the, we asked the consumer. <laughs> so we actually pulled the consumer and, and determined, you know, that, uh, that th this, this was an intrusion uh, according to what they were giving us as far as feedback. Wow. No. And on the back of that with compliance, if you're in a, a spot like Denver or Portland and you're required to have that exit bag, when you buy the product, are you able to kind of see it or does it just have that exit bag that you can't see? I mean, how does it stay in compliance or do you buy it and then someone puts it in the exit bag before you leave? How does that work? Yeah. So in California, we have uh, childproof bagging now on all products. Um, so as far as that goes, uh, some jurisdictions require exit bags. Uh, some do not. Uh, some just require opaque bags. And so we at the machine uh, provide bags uh, right near it. And um, the consumer is required to bag upon exiting um, in most cases. Uh, now, regarding the product itself, um, I don't know if you know much about kiosks, but let me explain a bit here. Uh Consumers that use kiosks tend to spend more money. This is just kind of uh, known by several studies that have been done in, in the in the kiosk industry over the years. And, and that's why you see this movement towards uh, self-service with um, companies like McDonald's, where they're now implementing huge programs for self-checkout. And so when the product is purchased from our kiosk, we actually blow that product up. Uh, we put a large image of that product on the screen. And then um, additionally, we add all the information associated with that product. For instance, for instance strengths, uh, what, what, the, what the function of that product will be for you uh, uh, and, and things like that. So we give a, a, large, a large image and a description of that product on the screen. And uh, it no seems idea. to do fine for the consumer. User interfaces are funny. You know, again, it's, it's really listening to the consumer, 
and giving them what they need. Most customers that, that are purchasing through machines are repeat customers. This is not for the first time customer. It's not for the customer that wants to consult with a bud tender. So the, this what about is really customers that don't want to buy suppositories. Like I don't want to go up to a counter, right. a, a kid and buy a product like that. So is it, is there an option for, you know, those other products as well as, uh, after hours, is there some regulations that could be passed or allowed to have after hours vending machines with your technology for facial recognition and MJ certification recognition and all of that? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm going to share the screen again here. Get to this Chrome oh, tab. I had no and, idea about that. Uh, people were more likely to buy more money or buy more stuff from a kiosk. And then I got, I mean, the idea of them not having the, uh, let's just put it on that real quick. All right. Go ahead, uh, Ron. Okay. Yeah. So uh, regarding uh, technologies, I mean, our flagship is our, is our grasshopper kiosk and that comes in a few flavors. We do that in a beverage machine, which dispenses cans and bottles. And then we also do that in a um, product machine, which the current model that we're building and, and deploying is a 36 SKU machine. So it will hold up to 36 individual SKUs. So you could put some of those products if you knew. And again, the data is going to dictate, you know, kind of what, what's selling, what's not selling. But the analytics side of this gets really interesting because I think we can start to target specific products that may, may have an inclination for, uh, for some privacy. We can start putting those products in. Currently, we use like the top selling products mm -hmm. uh, that are that are being uh, moved by the dispensary, or if it's a brand partnership, then it would be that brand specific. And so we would do more of a store within a store type of application, which would include some cabinetry for displaying products and uh, maybe some some area where you have some smell bottles if you have different types of a uh, flower in the machine and you want to display those. So you can add some physical attributes to the store within a store build out, which, um, which essentially is a surround around the machine with that cabinetry. Now for the, for, for the people that do want self checkout, we do have a product called grasshopper pay, which is essentially a curated list of machines, uh, similar to how we curate the kiosks. And, um, and then, uh, that would be for the consumer, for instance, that, that wanted to access these more private products. You could have, you know, 50 to hundred products or more, that you're selling through these touch screens that are either wall mount or standalone or almost like you see at Home Depot where you have the self checkout. Um, yeah. and Safeways in our area have them. I don't know what your major grocery is out there, but so that, that's guys, what that product is designed for. You would actually have an individualized payment solution. So like I could check out with uh, the stuff that I bought out of the kiosk and pay with credit cards or I mean, what type of payment solutions are you guys offering? Is it still just like feed the cash into the machine? Yeah, well, currently it is. Um, uh, there are solution providers out there that claim that they are totally compliant and that, you know, we, we, we will do some introductions to the ones that we have vetted. Um, I think we know that the, there are risks inherent with doing any type of payment that's card based, but uh, there, there are e-wallet solutions available. There are several types of solutions that we can integrate into our systems. So I think there's a lot of options popping up out there. And, um, and I think that the states are getting more laxed around the banking side and, and more comfortable with banking as, as the transactions are tracked, everything is, is compliant in the system with what the state's requiring. I think, the, I think that banks are feeling more comfortable banking cannabis businesses. Yeah, I think so. so. I, and I think they were feeling more comfortable even before Trump said that thing over the weekend. But uh, the, the Safe Banking Act coming up and passing in this, uh, this session that they have before the end of the fiscal year, at the end of the month, I think is huge. And hopefully they actually pass something. But I thought it was really interesting that your like your state is different in the sense that not only not only can you guys have a vending machine like we can't have in Illinois, but also you can have what did you call them? Smell bottles. What the heck is a smell bottle? We are. <laughs> yeah. you, Washington, I think, doesn't have those also. Right there. No, we're not allowed to have that. You can in Oregon, though. Yeah. And, and so, so, so is it just a bottle with a nug in it? It's like, hey, would you like a smell of this? Pretty much. That's How exactly. And they have little lids that pop up. Oh. Go ahead. I'm sorry. 
um, the gram that goes in there to make the smell needs to be tracked. I mean, like, <laughs> in the, I'm like I like the the vending machine concept that you have, especially with the state of Illinois, that requires when you leave the cultivation facility, you need to be packaged just like I guess with Prop 215 in California. Is that the one where you guys had to have complete packaging uh, and it was childproof, but when it was shipped out? I'm not sure. In Illinois, that's how it has to be here. Like the stuff is childproof and pre-packed when it's shipped out and it's it, there's no bulk flour. There's no smell uh, jars, nothing like that. Everything is we don't use uh, a, a kiosk or a, uh, a vending machine like you've been showing, but we use a lot of uh, just safes. So like people will go and they have their inventory in a safe and it's uh, a very bad user experience. I mean, it's like walking into a prison almost and, and asking for your medicine. They're like, hang on, I have to go get that. It's in lockup. Yeah, I, I totally feel what you're saying. That's, that's the reason that we're developing grasshopper lockers right now is because for the front office and back office, solving those issues that you're talking about are extremely important and giving solutions that make sense for not only the, uh, the retail stores, but also kind of the whole chain of custody along the way. And so we're working pretty diligently right now on developing that solution, which would include a weight measurement solution that would be integrated into the lockers. So you could actually put something in a large, large locker, say a 10 pound bag of cannabis that would then be uh, on a scale and it would continue to be weighed at all times so that you knew if something was happening. And then we tie that into a mobile app also. And our mobile app can be white labeled or gray labeled. And so those are kind of the products that are in development. And, and really, it's it's all about tracking through the custody, through that life cycle. And no, I, I get what you're saying, though, about the. Yeah, but what, when you look at those regulations that they're trying to achieve, it is exactly what you're talking about. And these types of solutions uh, help you achieve the, what the regulation is trying to, right. to do. And that's the tracking of all the sales, all the proceeds and all the grams. And it's it's like it's a machine that's specifically designed to do that, but you're not allowed right. to have the machine. It's uh, very strange, but you know that's one of the things that you can do to lobby uh, different states to adopt uh, the type of legislation that you need to enable the the continued spread of your business. I mean, uh, currently that that provision uh, it's under the prohibition section of the uh, Illinois uh, statute for cannabis dispensaries, where it's just a line item, no vending machines. So like you're kind of locked out of the industry here immediately. But then if you start lobbying them, you know, maybe in a subsequent amendment to this act, that'll get excised and then you can access this market because it's going to accomplish the ends of the statute that the state wants. They want to track the, uh, the, the product. They also want to understand who's buying it so that they can control the supply, you know, and it's quite elegant. Thank you. Appreciate that. Ron, yeah. I'd like to work with you on getting uh, Washington to allow vending machines. I'm chair on a committee to overturn a, a felony in Washington state that doesn't allow for the operation and maintenance of a marijuana lounge. So we have to overturn that felony with a lobbyist group called the Cannabis Alliance. So I'd like to work with you and another gentleman who's a, a chair committee for packaging uh, because we can't have recycling either in Washington. So it would be amazing if one of your vending machines had an option to bring in packaging. Dude tubes are everywhere. One of the most number one products sold in, in most of the emerging markets yeah. mm -hmm. is pre-rolls. So if we can recycle that stuff in one of your machines, that'd be phenomenal. So offline, let's let's touch base about that. I, I'd love to do that. I think it's a great initiative. I, I d definitely uh, think about the waste a lot related to especially uh, vape pens. I've noticed that some of the brands like Dosit, uh, in California are starting to uh, have recycling stations built into their build outs in store, which is really cool. So this would kind of follow suit with that. But I, I agree. We, you know, that this is a, another huge area, um, uh, 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 an issue area for the industry. Is, is it's an uphill battle. Issue. We can't have recycling. We can't have vending machines. We can't have marijuana lounges. So it's, yeah, yeah I mean, like, and you are Washington state, one of the old guard of cannabis right. legalization. Half decade just slogging through it, you know? 
Learning a lot. That's amazing. But that gets back to uh, the distinction that we were just talking about earlier. You guys are both in the legislative ballot initiative type states where you as the people tell the legislature what to do. And they're like, "Mm, maybe we'll do this instead or we'll do that. And then you still have to keep battling them and battling the continued kind of like what do they call it, general prejudice that they have against uh, cannabis. And I, I thought, you know, it just seems like some of the, uh, the the stuff that comes out of Washington State, that prejudice is still alive and well, even though you guys have had lawful cannabis for 10, 11 years. When did you guys go medical? We went medical, I think, in 96. And then in uh, we oh, went wow. rec. We became a regulated market in July of 2015. Um and I don't think, I mean, it's not really my my opinion or even a conspiracy theory. I think it's really well known in Washington that the regulators being the LCB or Liquor and Cannabis Board, they do not like cannabis. They, that's why they threw out the, with eight days left, they're going to let us you know, give a, a quick opinion about social equity and how to uh, implement you know small business growth opportunities uh, and some, some other things. But why only give us a week before Labor Day? You know, it's because they don't value our opinions. They don't care and they just want to implement what they're doing or whoever came in with the money first, uh, right? And so it's it's like that Friday news dump. They just kind of hope to throw it out there and, and see what happens. Maybe it'll get buried by the end of the weekend. Uh, but Washington is, is one of those states where I do not recommend doing business in, uh, but it is a microcosm that should be examined thoroughly so you know what worst case scenario is in your own market. Hmm. Uh, would you say, I just have a quick follow up on that. Would, I, I think I saw something recently on CBD from hemp uh, being, uh, passed in Washington regarding the, um, the consumption side of using CBD and products that are consumed. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. We got jealous of, of California last year, banning edibles and beverages and it was CBD products. So yeah, we, we followed suit on that for whatever reason. I don't know who, uh, Uh Whose idea that was? But yeah, that yeah. was literally last week's show. We had uh, somebody's oh. business just completely railroaded by the state. Uh, one day she's at Hemp Fest. She's got herself a tent. She spent all that money. She's going to have a product launch. It's going well. The next day, it's illegal. She's literally out of business. And that's after fighting five years trying to transition from medical to the regulated market and then saying, okay, I'm going to pivot to CBD and then having that hit you. I mean, that's that's a small business nightmare. That's tough. And that's, yeah. that's the, the par for the course kind of with the cannabis industry. Uh, Ron, how long have you been in the industry? Well, I, I came from the ATM industry and, uh, and kiosk industry. So my, my, my time in, indus- in that industry was about 20 years or so. Mm-hmm. And uh, I migrated. I was looking at cannabis over the last 10 years or so and then migrated in uh, officially about three years ago. And uh, I feel like it's been 10 years in three years. Why, why do you of, feel like it's been 10 years in three years? I'll just tell you that the pivots are ridiculous in this industry. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. Uh, you, you think you have a business plan to your point about your friend there that went to the, the hemp show. And then the next thing you know, you don't have a business. And so I think that there has to be better leadership on the legislative side and and, and in terms of thinking about small businesses and how they can exist in an industry that's going to be dominated by major corporations in very short order. So I think, yeah, I mean, I really think, and I I think what you guys are are talking about, these kind of issues are very important and they need to become uh, front of mind for for people in the industry or they, or they're just, they're not, we're not going to have small players. Well, that's that's really absolutely important, and it really depends on how the, the regulations go. So one of the things that I'm in, uh, impressed with the Illinois regulation, I'm not thrilled about the number of licenses, but I am thrilled about the restriction of the overlap of ownership of licenses. So the most uh, dispensary licenses any player can touch is just 10. So because of that, you've, you've really uh, dispersed the industry so that no one MSO is going to be so dominant. Like is they, mm. they greenlit more or less 500 dispensaries. So 10 
over 500, that's not enough to be a major player. That's not like Google that's going to be you know dominating 80% of the share search market. And right. they've done the same thing when it comes to if you own the cultivation license, you are restricted on can you own the craft grow, the smaller license. You can, I think from my reading, it's very restrictive, but it looks like you might be able to own 10%. So like uh, mm. a, a large grower could have like their own captive kind of like funky uh, craft brand that they could kind of use a little bit, but it can only have like 10% of, of ownership. But then right. also they limit your ability to hold uh, multiple craft grow licenses. So under the statute, they've greenlit 150 is the, the cap, the maximum, and you're not allowed to touch more than three. So three out of 150, it's very uh, dif dispersed, not very uh, vertically or centrally uh, organized so that you're going to have a lot of M&A because suddenly you're going to be maxed out. It's going to be like, sorry, I have my three licenses. We now have to lobby the state to allow me to have 30 or, or however large they wanted to get. But you spoke to pivot. Right. How many of those pivots were uh, legislative actions? Oh, boy. I think over half were. Yeah, because uh, yeah, we went from medical to uh, recreational. And then within recreational, uh, we learned very quickly that we had to to um, uh, address certain regulatory uh, requirements. And then, um, then I think uh, within that, uh, the customer kept changing for us. So we... We uh, have pivoted more towards brands lately because brands are the ones that are seeking to have space within dispensaries. So our customers end up being both the brands and the dispensaries in the cannabis world. Uh, it's got kind of an interesting shift that's occurred. Um, and, and, you know, in California, we have several hundred brands that are vying for shelf space. So it's, uh, you know, with, with our machines, you're able to create your own shelf space as a brand. I think that's very unique as far as what uh, what brands are looking at doing currently in California. Which the trend guys, is, is a pay to play model. Just, I don't know if you guys are aware of that. Really? All right. You're not allowed to pay to play. They say you're not allowed to pay to play in Illinois. That's what the statute provides at least. But uh, the question of sourcing flour is still going to come up for your retail sp space. Right. And so, I mean, we only have 20 players for right now. And then there's only going to be 40 craft grows and then 60 craft grows over the next few years, we'll still have very small amount of players relative to California. How are they sourcing flour to you? I mean, you say that you're, you're working more with brands and then you can, you're brokering in shelf space to your clients. How does that translate to me as an upstart cultivator getting uh, my brand into your machine so that I can hopefully get some more sales? How do you guys source flour out west? Yeah, so so two, okay, so we're not plant touching in our business. Um, we're really the shelf space for those brands and for those dispensaries. And so uh, right now it's dictated by what the dispensary uh, is selling. Uh, typically they'll want to put their top selling items or or items that they know people will want to grab and go. Um, on the brand side, to get into one of our machines, it really is a partnership uh, with us and the brand. And then we work with that brand creating a program to help them to penetrate the dispensaries that they would like to get into. So we're really acting in several kind of roles with these brands. It's uh, it's almost like more of an outsource kind of arrangement after after we uh, introduce them to the technology and they figure out how they want to kind of implement a program for their, for their brand, then, then it's really uh, taking, taking what that, what that program looks like, putting some guidelines around it, and then uh, uh, giving them the ability to drive that, that system into the dispensaries that they want to be in. And so it's at the end of the day, we're not, we're agnostic to brand. We really work with large brands and small brands. So really, it's it's not uh, it's more of an issue of are they the right fit for this type of technology and it does their brand have the potential of being kind of a more mass market type of brand. What products are ideal for that situation? If uh, you know vending sells more, what is it selling more of? Obviously, if I put rice and batteries like. I've seen in, in Japan, true mm -hmm. story, by the way, same vending oh. machine. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's not going to be the, the best uh, product. Yeah. So what, what does sell well? Uh, it seems like uh, in the grab and go scenario, it's pre-rolls, uh, eighths of flour, um, small packages of edibles, um, 
things that you would think that I, I'm just here to grab something and I want to get out. Almost like you went and you grabbed milk and bread at the store. It's a it's a similar thing for a cannabis user. What, what are their everyday kind of go-tos that they use? Uh, it could be a cartridge of a certain type. And so um, mostly that, you know, we are stocking all categories for, you know, for the, the, the brands and the dispensaries. So the products I see them moving through the machines are, are, um, are really uh, on the flower side and concentrate side. I think those are their probably their higher moving products. Yeah, that's so. that complies with what we have here in Illinois. The stats are about right down the middle, 50% uh, concentrate, mostly vapes, and then 50% mm -hmm. flower and pre-rolls are quite popular. But yeah. everything is pre-packaged in Illinois. So that would really align itself well to the, the usage of some type of automatic dispensing and record keeping agent because when it leaves the facility, it's shrink wrapped and childproof and it's already weighed and, and it's ready to get to the consumer's hand. Right. And, and that's the second go large. Go ahead, Ron. Sorry. Oh, go ahead, Josh. Well, I was going to ask, because that is the second largest investment vehicle this year. And so you've got a, a nice little array from from every angle. Uh, apps, we've seen, you know, people have to give their, their first child away uh, yeah. to the developer. And everything to the vending machine from your your phone is data, and so that's that's intriguing to me. I want to know a little bit more about what you're using the data for, what you plan on doing, uh, and any like upgrades or, or future things that you might be using that data for. Well, again, the, the the data the the data that's coming off of the machine is owned by our customer, which is typically a dispensary or a brand, and so. What we would do is provide access to all of that data. Uh, what, what I what I assume or what I kind of look at as the opportunities for these brands is to really mine the data related to the consumer and then figure out which products are selling through at the best rates. Also, using that data uh, uh, for for creating a better consumer experience. Uh, and, 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 and including digital into that experience so that they're able to engage, for instance, through a mobile app where they can send out direct messaging on uh, appearances that are going to be made by their brand uh, ambassadors or things that connect them to a brand. I mean, I think this is where brands struggle in this crowded uh, scape is that they're going to, and they're going to continue to struggle with this as they compete, is how do we engage directly with a consumer? I mean, I feel like our machines are the next best thing to the CEO speaking directly to the consumer because they can, they can, go ahead. I'm sorry. Why, why would you say that? Well, I mean, if you want to put messaging out and you want that messaging to be consistent to a consumer, the best way to do that is through a, a kind of programmed type of message. And so we're able to do that with the machines. I mean, it's consistent. It never changes. You don't have one bud tender saying one thing another bud tender saying another thing with maybe a perverse kind of uh, incentive. Um, and so it really becomes a very standardized messaging format for your brand. That's what you hear in every branding 101 case that you always go. It needs to have that consistency, that expectation. It needs to be the exact same thing that's replicable. Can you imagine if I walked into uh, the McDonald's in Seattle and their burger was entirely different than if I went to the McDonald's <laughs> in San Francisco and I'm like, wow, they don't do McDonald's like they do here in Chicago. And, and that would create a brand nightmare. And so you really do see uh, a payout payoff to these brands because they are able to create a consistent rep yeah. replicable experience with their customer uh, through the usage of these types of, of uh, solutions. Totally. Yes, exactly. That's exactly the correct assumption. Fascinating. Can you infer from that data what the purchasing decision is when making the decision to go with yeah. the vending machine yeah. over traditional routes? Absolutely. We can watch the click throughs. We can we can capture that data, deliver back exactly what occurred at the machine. So we, we know what, what other products are being looked at. We know, you know, again, I mean, this is about creating better relationships with your consumers. At the end of the day, data can be used for a bunch of things. But in our world, I think it's really just selling products. If we keep it that simple at its base, and how do we sell products better to the people that want to buy them? Right. Um, I think that that's the part we have to uncomplicate for these brands. 
Well, I mean, so many of these people that get into the industry that aren't necessarily uh, the best at sales. I mean, so many companies, they may win a license and they might not understand branding and they may not understand marketing and they may not understand how the Internet works. And it could cost them, you know, business down the line. But when you have that data, who do you get to sell it back to? I mean, you said it, your your customers own it. So it's that uh, an extra revenue stream on your business currently where you have access to data or like parse it for them or give them industry trends or what? Yeah, I think the very few companies have actually figured out how they're going to monetize the data. And I think that that's kind of in flux. Uh, the way I see it is that um, we have the mechanism to, to drive it. Um, how you want to use it as a customer of ours is your choice. I think, I think that like, like I, I don't feel like it's been defined. Well. And I think if you talk to the data experts, some of them may have some answers, but I, I'd like to see the monetization kind of uh, model to, 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 you know, and not many are going to be able to share that with you. Yeah. I, I mean, like uh, the Analytica place that used the Facebook data to kind of swing the elections and Brexit, uh, Cambridge Analytica. So that gets me to a question. Can I use my Facebook login to create a user account on your uh, machine so that you can get like a pixel of me and then use my entire Facebook uh, profile and, uh, you know, all the, the data points that they have about me in formulating what your clients may want in their cannabis products? The answer is yes, of course we can. Um, uh, the consumer uh, may be a little resistant to this. Um, we currently have planned into the mobile app, which is a product that is under development, um, the ability to log in with your Google account and create a user profile. And then we use the same uh, type of uh, system as uh, Airbnb to do uh, consumer uh, authentication or verification of identity mm -hmm. uh, through the mobile app. So, so, so the answer is that, you know, of course you can. Uh, how much do, is, it, is it seen as an intrusion uh, by the end user. And so we want to make sure that we stay, stay clear of those types of issues. We don't want to be seen as the guys that are collecting data uh, on consumers for the purpose of uh, collecting data. We actually want to make it useful to both sides of the equation, which are the consumer and the brand and the dispensary, the retailer, so that this is kind of a full circle relationship and, and symbiotic relationship uh, that is beneficial to everybody. I just got a text for a discount code, and I'm wondering if I walk by a store that has one of your vending machines, will I get a notification to kind of come in and uh, buy something out of your vending machine for a discount, customized, I that, personalized? Um, I, I think that it can through some of the systems. Uh, in the mobile app, we definitely have that option for brands and for dispensaries to uh, do those push notifications to their consumer base. So they can do it. To, to groups of them or to the whole base. It's kind of their choice how they like to use the system. Pretty awesome, man. Uh, so what do you think are the trends that are coming? I mean, if, with what you've seen so far in your uh, industry experience over the last three years, uh, tell us what you think the rest of 20, tw uh, 2019 and into 2020 has to bring. Oh man, I think this is going to be a, a crazy couple of years for us. I think we have a, uh, Huge, huge expansion throughout the United States uh, on the retail side. I think medical is expanding into recreational. Uh, we got, we'll see several new states come online. Um, I, I believe that um, the use of automated retail will become stronger in certain areas, uh, technology-based areas like California mm -hmm. and, uh, and other states, probably Washington and others. Um, and that... Uh, you know, I think I think it's going to become more mainstream. I think the acceptance of CBD, hemp-based CBD products, uh, is on the upswing. Uh, that industry is driving acceptance uh, generally of the of the terminology CBD. So you're seeing, um, I'm getting calls like from my 75 uh, year old aunt that's asking me uh, questions about like I know nothing about CBD really. I don't know much about the product. She's asking me which one she should use, and so. Um, I think utilizing technologies uh, and uh, uh, like like ours in the future are definitely going to be part of the retail experience. Um, I think that they're needed to create some standardization in how people take information and um, and, and so on. And uh, 
uh, yeah. So yeah, I think there's a lot of growth potential here uh, in all, all parts of the industry. Awesome. Okay. Well, One thing I might add too is we are doing another seed round. It's going to be our final seed round before our A round. So if uh, anybody out there is interested, uh, feel free to look us up. You can grab our information from the blog and um, be happy to, to talk to you about what we're doing at Grasshopper. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, it's beginning. It's starting to uh, get to that time. But we did have a couple questions come in from engineering cannabis uh, for people who just tuned in. Are the machines environmentally controlled? And for states that outlaw facial recognition, how is that going to be handled? Yes, they are environmentally controlled. They can be temperature controlled, humidity controlled, and so on. So we have, we have talked through that. Uh, uh, we typically run them at a, at a fixed temperature that that's, uh, adheres to pretty much all products across the board. Uh, seems to do fine with that, but they can be refrigerated. For instance, our beverage machine is, is at a refrigerated temperature, so you can get the beverages out cold. Not that you want to consume them as you go out the door or anything, but some, some places are having on-site consumption now in California. Good. Uh, that, that's kind of a trend now that it's there is a, a place near or in the facility where you can consume. So, um, and then the second question, Lauren? Yes, uh, and states that outlaw uh, facial recognition, how is that going to be handled with your kiosks? Yeah, that's one of the reasons we didn't go with facial recognition. Um, there's an upstart in the industry that, that is touting facial recognition as a methodology for, um, uh, for verifying customers. And we wanted to go with something that was already being used, that was kind of a standard, uh, rather than trying to push the envelope on delivering new solutions. So we, we don't anticipate pushing that unless... Uh, unless it's needed uh, by the by our customer, which is a brand or a dispensary. So we do offer a biometric tied to our mobile app. That's the way that you enter the mobile app. And in fact, you wouldn't be able to purchase cannabis with the mobile app unless you did enter your biometric, which is what you do to open your phone now. So it's kind of a thing we're all used to and trained. I, I believe in, in working within the guidelines of what our society is desiring rather than trying to push things onto to uh, people or requirements is just not the way to sell things. So, word. All right. Well, it was a pleasure talking with you. Uh, where can we follow what's going on at uh, Grasshopper Kiosk? Well, we do post on uh, the the major social medias, but um, we also have a blog site uh, embedded in our website, I believe, and uh, uh, directly, you know, directly connect to us through any of those and. Uh, we will be at uh, MJ BizCon this year also, in December. And, uh, there was so. a thousand booths at MJ BizCon last year, and <laughs> Grasshopper Kiosk was one of the coolest products there. So I'm looking well, forward thanks, to Well, thanks, Josh. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you very much. We try really hard to be on top of what, uh, what, what the needs of the industry are and stay focused on our customer, because I think that's the most important thing at the end of the day. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, Josh, where can we follow you? You can catch me at thetalkinghedgepodcast.com or you can email me at josh at thetalkinghedge.com. Travis? Use Google Cannabis Lawyer and then you can find me at cannabisindustrylawyer.com. Awesome. Thanks, guys, for watching. Uh, tune in next week and we will be talking with um, Armin from, uh, well, it's a little surprise, but he's going to be discussing a little bit about um, cannabis and uh you know recycling so that'll be an interesting podcast uh tune in next week and we'll see you on wednesday looking forward to it 2 p.m thank you very much lauren for putting this together much appreciated later guys peace Bye, thanks